welcome, welcome, welcome to our online experience. And I wanted to just say welcome home, or I should say uh, thank you for welcoming, welcoming us into your homes. We're grateful that you're tuning in today. We're a church that really believes in the power of a relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we're hoping that all that you experience today really lends itself towards the growth of that specific relationship. We believe that that relationship is the key to unlocking everything that this life has to offer you. And so this church is built on the promises that we can know God, find freedom, discover purpose, and make a difference through a relationship with Jesus. With that said, I just want to say big thanks to Pastor Pete. Let's give it up for Pastor Pete for just a great message last week in the comments. Just go ahead and and type in where you're tuning in from and just maybe how much you appreciate the word that he gave and worship this morning. Grateful for the team that God is growing and building and just grateful for you tuning in. So we are in our third week in this series called Together Living That Ohana Life. Of course, you know if you've ever been to Hawaii, Ohana means family. And uh, the last couple of weeks, we have been digging into a deeper book study, specifically of the book of 1 Corinthians. So I want you to turn, if, uh, if you can, right now to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, uh, verses 18 through 31 of the verses that we're going to cover today. And every week, I just want to remind you that there is an incredible tool that you can watch for free online called The Bible Project, and they have an incredible summary of the book of 1 Corinthians in about seven and a half minutes that you can watch. I would just encourage you to watch it every single week before Sunday morning. We will focus on a very specific text, but that gives you the bigger, broader picture of what the book is all about, and it will help you understand these messages even better. Well, the word essential has been a word that you have heard a lot lately. It's not a new word, but it's a word that has been used a lot, and my question for today as we dig into the text is, what is essential? Uh, My definition of essential is something that I cannot live without. Now, I have up here with me just a very small pocket knife. In um, the world of man, which is the only world I really know about, um, so you just take it or leave it. In the world of man, the, the bigger the pocket knife you have, the more of a man you are. So this is about how big of a man I am, right? Small pocket knife, but men, just pull out your pocket knives, wave them. We, we judge each other based on the size of our pocket knives. And there was a big catastrophic event that happened, actually, that we, that, we, that we remembered this week that changed everything for the world of pocket knives. Do you know what I'm talking about? 9-11. 9-11 changed forever the essentiality, if I could use that word, of pocket knives because whenever you get on a plane, you are not allowed to have a pocket knife. Now, growing up, I realized how important pockets, pocket knives were, and so I asked for one for Christmas. My parents gave me, you know, the little, the little red Swiss Army pocket knife, the very basic one. Uh, I later learned that you could literally get ones that were so thick that, like, there's a tool for everything right there on your pocket knife. I never got one of those, but I started off with one of those really small ones, and I, I later realized that it wasn't just the pocket knife that you could do so much with, because... At about the same time I was watching a particular show, I realized that there was a tool on my pocket knife that I had never used before, the toothpick. You see, if you are as old as I am, which is 40 this Christmas, I'm just going to take away all the guessing, you grew up with a show called MacGyver. Anybody remember MacGyver? He, He was a man amongst men because he didn't even need a pocket knife. All he needed was a toothpick and and maybe some duct tape, and he could literally save the world from nuclear explosions, and I just grew up looking up to him. And I think about these things when I think about the word essential. What literally can we not live without? When I was interviewing to be the pastor of this church, the elders of this church asked me a really interesting question. They shared uh, a story of a consultant who came in and asked them, if your church was burning down, what would you save it? They gave three answers. They said the first thing that we would save is the word of God. The second thing that we would save is our kids. And the third thing that we would save is the lost, people who don't know Jesus. And friends, when you ask that question, what is essential, it forces you to think about what matters most. And it's actually a clarifying, beautiful process because I find that we carry a lot of baggage with us in life 
And when it comes to unity, a lot of times that baggage can get us in places where we have conflict. But when we focus on what matters most, we have the most potential to be unified. Augustine has a famous quote that I think uh, would be good for us to make our anthem during this season. In essentials, unity. In non-essentials, liberty. But in all things, love. So what would Paul say as he is advising the Corinthians about what matters most? Well, that's what we're going to look at today. He is going to focus in on, Pete referenced it last week when we are introduced to the problem of divisions, cracks in the foundation of this community. He references it in verse 17. Let's just go ahead and pull up that verse from last week. For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to preach the gospel, and not with words of eloquent wisdom, not with words of eloquent wisdom, lest the cross of Christ be emptied of its power. I want to I just reemphasize what Pete referenced last week. The foundation of his ministry was not water baptism, and I'm going to explain why. Water baptism isn't something that is unimportant to a Christian. It's just not the foundation because it is symbolic of the thing that God has already done. That's why we don't do infant baptisms because we believe that it's an adult choice of choosing Jesus and what God has done in that adult heart of choosing him. In other words, you can go to heaven without being water baptized. How do I know that? Because the thief on the cross did. Jesus promised him that he would be with him in paradise. It's not that we don't encourage people to follow the commandment of Matthew 28 and be baptized, but that's not the foundation of any Christian community. The foundation of any Christian community is this, the gospel and the preaching of the gospel. This is the most essential message that the church has today, and we're going to dive into what the gospel means. Now, a couple months ago, I can't even remember which message it was, but I defined the gospel as God's desire for us to have more. And I believe the gospel is still simply defined by that, but if I were to go a little bit deeper, I believe it's more in terms of our relationship with him, finding freedom in him, discovering our purpose in him, and making a difference because of what he has done in my life. But it is all dependent on our relationship with Jesus. His life, his teachings, his death, and his resurrection. God has more for us, and it starts with the gospel. It is an essential that we cannot compromise. So I want you to turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. We're going to skip ahead to verse 18. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of of God. So there's a different definition of wisdom that we're going to explore, which leads to salvation. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise, and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? Now remember, Paul is talking to people who are divided based on their preference of speaker. So there are some in his audience who love Apollos, the Greek-educated orator. He could eloquently deliver a message that was just about perfect, right? I think of, for some of our older, older timers, I think of George Wood. Man, the guy could preach a perfect message. And then there was Peter, who was a Jewish fisherman, and there was a different group who appreciated him. Maybe they liked his stories that he told. Maybe they liked his life application. And then there was Paul, and then there was the crowd who really liked Jesus. They were the super spiritual ones. And what Paul is trying to do is bring them back together to the foundational truth, the essential thing of what actually binds us together. It's it's not a person or a personality. For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs, and Greeks seek wisdom. Now remember, he's primarily speaking to Greeks, but he's broadening this out to all people, including Jews. In Paul's day, there really were only Greeks and Jews. So he's talking to everyone here. But we 
We preach Christ crucified. We preach Christ crucified. A stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ, the power of God and the wisdom of God. Just go ahead and circle those two words, those two nouns, power and wisdom. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. Father, we just pray that you'd be able to speak to us today. Help us to embrace your gospel, not on our terms, but on your terms. In Jesus' name, amen. One of the cool things about doing live services online through the digital experience is we have no idea who's watching. And I just feel like this, this message is really directed at someone who's been on the outskirts looking in. They've been wondering, where does Christianity start? What do I have to do to be a part of it? Is it valid? And I want to start with you by saying this. The gospel begins with God's wisdom, not man's wisdom. Paul isn't referencing a new idea here, right? This is literally what Jesus came out with. A couple years ago, we did a whole series through the, the book of Mark. Mark chapter 115. Remember when Jesus, these are the very, this is the very first sermon that Jesus ever, ever preached. It was a real short one. But it has to do with the gospel. He said, the time has come because I'm here. I'm the fulfillment of every promise in the Old Testament. I'm going to make it all happen. But you who are listening, repent. Metanoia, believe the good news. Repent and believe the good news that God has something more for you and it's me. So turn and follow me. Turn. <laughs> turn. Believe something different. And Jesus spent three years of his life teaching, delivering, healing to prove that what he promised he was going to deliver. And then he surprised everyone by dying on a cross <laughs> And it was a mind-blowing thing for Jesus, the Messiah, to die on the cross. It says in verse 18 that the Greeks and the Jews just could not understand the cross. Why? Because the cross was a Roman instrument of torture. It would be like me saying that Jesus died in an electric chair. It's insane. And yet this was the path that God himself came to do on our behalf. Verse 22 says, if the Jews would have had it their way, they would have demanded signs and miracles, and you see that in Jesus' ministry. They were constantly demanding signs. In fact, Jesus has some altercations with them. In fact, even in one altercation, he says, the only sign I'm gonna give you is the sign of Jonah, <laughs> which if you study that passage, you understand that it's the sign of Jesus raising himself from the dead after spending three days in the grave and yet here's a critical critical point miracles don't always lead to belief in God friends I know I want to be a charismatic church I want to be a church that has words of knowledge and prophetic words and healings but Jesus told us himself that sometimes people don't believe when these things happen the people in his day were probably the biggest examples of that can you imagine Jesus himself walking around for three years teaching and doing miracles and they weren't actually enough because not everyone followed him especially because of his death on the cross in verse 22 it says Greeks they seek wisdom the word for that is philosophy and to the Jews the cross was a stumbling block to the Greeks his crucifixion was just total foolishness why would someone put their faith and hope and trust in this crucified person? What I love about this passage is Paul is waiting to put the emphasis on the resurrection. Oh, friends, we're going there. But he sounds almost Catholic to us today, doesn't he? Where he places the focus of the impact on his crucifixion. Because there is no resurrection without the cross. The cross was the road that God took to purchase our redemption, our righteousness, and our sanctification. We're going to look at that in a second. And when Jesus embraced the cross, he became not our power in a social sense to move up the levels of social stratification, but the power 
of God to save us from our sins and the wisdom of God that leads to more knowledge and revelation of him, not relationship or fulfillment outside of that. What would this look like in today's world, in Orange County, where this church is based out of? Friends, many people don't realize this, but in almost every worldview that you can imagine, there is some kind of secular salvation spiritual pathway that people can follow. You see, you hear it when people say, man, if I can just marry the right person, everything will be okay. That's salvation language. If I could just find someone who will stand with me when times are tough, if I could just figure out what my gifts have, have been designed for, again, outside of relationship with God, if I can find a career, then that will make my life worth living. And some have given up that. They've, they've focused on other things. If I could just travel to 178 nations, I don't know what their goal is, but I, I, I want to find out the meaning of life by traveling and by having an adventure. Or I want to accumulate as many things as possible. You see that boat out there? I want to own that boat and a whole fleet of them like it. Some people have placed their faith in science. If we could just figure out the, the, the right meaning behind all of this COVID, we could just figure out how to save us from this, and yet, have we really saved ourselves from anything? Paul is directly attacking the intellectualism that existed in the Corinthian church. There are those who have education and those who have built up their lives with knowledge, but it hasn't necessarily led to them being closer to Jesus. How do I know that? Because of the rest of the book of Corinthians. They get in sexual sin, they forget the purpose of the gathering, and they aren't leading people to a closer, closer relationship with him. But the one that I think that is the most dangerous right now in our society is the path to salvation that looks like this. When I learn to accept myself, then I'll be saved. When I, when I learn to just accept my sexuality, then I'll be okay. Or the way that I, I, I look at things the way that I look at things, and when I, when, I, when I realize and find a community that will just let me be me, I'll be okay. Friends, at the, at the very foundation of what faith in God means, it is Jesus coming to our broken condition, addressing the things that are cracked, even when we don't even realize it. Otherwise, we wouldn't have any scriptures to deal with. You could be a Christian and still have cracks in your foundation if you're operating in man's wisdom. And that is exactly what it is, man's wisdom. It is not God's wisdom. If we followed man's wisdom, we'll end up nowhere. But if we follow God's wisdom, even though it looks like foolishness to everyone else, we'll actually discover an essential for unity, this actually brings us all together because we are all screwed up. But God, in his grace and his mercy, are slowly rebuilding us, crafting us together as a body to reach people for him. Belief in the gospel, belief in Jesus is the foolishness of God, and this is an essential for unity. Verses 26 through 29 says this, For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you are wise according to worldly standards. Not many of you are powerful. Not many of you are of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. He chose those who would allow God to come into their lives and lead. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are, so that no human might boast in the presence of God. The gospel begins with God's wisdom, and the gospel keeps us humble so that we don't get prideful. Pete talked about this last week, how pride can get into a church and destroy it because the emphasis is on us rather than what God has done. Paul knows that if this church is going to be unified, it can't just be told not to be, not to be in disunity. They have to actually have someone 
to gather around. And that person that we gather around is Jesus. And the closer we get to Jesus, the more we realize how incredible he is and how humble we should stay because he just keeps picking us. I remember when I was a little kid, I hated recess because recess was a time inevitably where they would choose teams. How many of you know what I'm talking about? It's just the feeling that you get when you get lined up and and the two most athletic kids are looking at the line and they're thinking, who has the qualifications and the stature and the athletic ability? Who can catch that long bomb down the side to, you know, make sure that we're on the part of the recess Super Bowl winning team? And it's like this exercise in, uh, uh, I hate this. Unless you were the one that always got drafted first or you were the one doing the picking. But that's how humans are. We have this, and this is not how God's work. Have you, just look in the Old Testament how many secondborns God chooses. Look at the story of David. He's like the eighth son. You know what he's always looking for? He's just looking for someone who will let him lead. Because when Jesus is leading, there's less we have to worry about. And we make, when we make our testimony about what God has done, it keeps us humble. You get to the New Testament, and this wasn't really exemplified until I was watching a series this last week during the quarantine situation. I don't know if you ever watched it. It was called The Chosen. It, was a, it is an amazing series. They're about to do season two. But probably the most powerful moments in that series was when Jesus looked right in the eyes of the men and and the women that he chose to ask to follow him, and he said, follow me. And the first one that I remember is, there were some others, but just the two stark ones in my head right now are are the calling of Peter. You remember when, you know, he, 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 Peter is like a cheater. He's, he's out there doing what he can to like, you know, get fish while other people are, and he's defying Roman rule. He's doing, he's cutting corners, and he's just a common fisherman looking to, to make the most with what he has with his family. He's very ambitious. And after he sees Jesus multiply the fish, he realizes, and you hear some of the most humble things come out of his mouth, like, whoa, Jesus, do you know who I, do you know who I am? I wonder if that's how you feel, or if you somehow feel entitled, like you're a first-round pick that God is obligated to pick. The kind of person that God can use is the person who recognizes that God really doesn't need me. He can use a whole lot of other people. But what's ironic to me is that when Peter is hanging out with the group and Jesus is walking through the market and he looks at Matthew taking taxes and he looks at him and his look just pierces Matthew. He stops doing everything. And he says, Matthew, follow me. And you know what Peter does? He says, Jesus, do you know who this guy is? Do you know what he's done? Do you know what his past is? And it's like we forget where we come from. We forget who we are. Once Jesus starts using us, it's all of a sudden we start thinking that we're, we're made of something. We've got something. And yet God wants us to stay humble. Let the gospel keep us humble. This will keep our church unified. This week I was doing a little study and I came across an author of great music by the name of Isaac Watts. How many of you have heard of Isaac Watts? My wife said, who's Isaac Watts? one of the greatest Christian songwriters really in all of history. He wrote 750 songs that we know of. At the age of 18, he was making fun of the worship music in the church that he attended. So I guess this isn't anything new. And his dad said, if you think you're so great, why don't you start writing worship music? And he started. And I guess he was pretty good at it. Next generation, if you don't like the worship music, come on, just get involved and start writing music and you could be the next Isaac Watts. I, I, I love it. The dad challenged him, and he stepped up. What I find interesting about Isaac Watts is that he went to study for four years, and at the age of 22, he became a tutor, a private tutor for six years. At the age of 28, he became a pastor, and he lasted for 10 years and had to quit. Maybe because life was hard, maybe because ministry is hard, maybe because his 
He had just had some disappointing experiences. One of the disappointing experiences that he had was he was trying to win the heart of a beautiful singer in his day. Her name was Elizabeth. She was a, a wonderful poet. Her name was actually Elizabeth Singer. And they had corresponded through letters, uh, and they had fallen in love. And, and unlike online dating today, where you have access to seeing a picture of someone, they had none of that. All they, all they could do was fall in love with the essence of the person. And they had fallen in love with each other until Elizabeth saw Isaac. She was quoted as saying, If I only admired the casket as much as I admire the jewel it contains. Boy, that's sad. She rejected his invitation to marry him, and he stayed single his entire life. When he was 38, and he couldn't do pastoral ministry anymore, he accepted the invitation to go live on someone's property, and really for the last 40 years of his life, he struggled with sickness, and, and yet he still could sing one of the most famous songs that we have in Christian liturgy, when we survey the wonderful cross, we're humbled because Jesus did that for me. Even when we had nothing to offer the world, Jesus did that for me. And God qualifies those who answer the call because those who answer the call realize that none of us are qualified. Friends, can I tell you that there's no amount of theological education that you could get there's no amount of pastoral ministry experience you can accumulate. There's no number of countries that you can visit that qualifies you for relationship with God. He did it in his own strength because he loved you right where you were, for who you were, and enough to not leave you there. But if you let him lead, if you let him lead you, He'll prepare you for even greater things. I've been thinking about this idea the last couple months because I have felt unqualified to lead you every single day. How do you lead through COVID-19? I don't know. How do you lead through racial unrest? I don't know. How do you lead through a big building transition and move? I, I, I don't know. But I know Jesus. Verse 30 through 31 says this. And because of him, you are in Christ Jesus, who became to us wisdom from, the, from God, righteousness and sanctification and redemption, so that as it is written, let the one who boasts, boast in the Lord. The gospel starts with his wisdom. I don't understand it all the time, but Jesus became flesh. God became flesh in Christ and went to the cross. And this should keep us humble because when we answer his call, we realize that he did this for us. And friends, this is one thing in scripture that it gives you rights to brag about. The gospel is boastworthy. It's something that you can and should talk about. Here's the challenge, do you? Do you actually brag or boast about what God has done? Here, here's the reality, God did what we couldn't do. He placed us in Christ. He gave us wisdom from God, righteousness, which is basically, in essence, doing the right thing every single time. None of us have done that. Sanctification, setting us apart for what his work is for us. And finally, redemption. He purchased us from a pathway that would have led to total destruction, and it's all because of Jesus, what he did on the cross, the pain that he endured. And our testimony shouldn't sound like we're bragging about ourselves. It really should sound like this is the work of God in us. And friends, you can be a hero in this world. And all you have to do is share how God has saved you. You can share the good news of Jesus Christ that God has more for us through him. If you'll just offer what you have so others can be saved. I don't know if you saw the movie Dunkirk, but it was a, uh, a civil war, not a civil war, a, a, a war battle where over the course of nine days, 339,000 people were rescued when civilians, regular people who had boats, began to ferry the soldiers across. But this week I watched a 10-minute documentary 
that Tom Hanks narrated called Boat Lift. Really encourage you to watch it. It's a documentary about the story of September 11th and how in less than nine hours, 500,000 people on the island of Manhattan were ferried away when ordinary people chose to use their boats. And you know what I find ironic? In times of crisis, when the officials and the authorities get involved, they throw the regulations out the door. <laughs> There's one guy who was being interviewed said, they, did, they asked the question, how many people can your boat fit? And the guy said, well, I'm legal up to 12. And he said, no. I said, how many people can your boat fit without sinking? And that guy crammed like 40 people on his boat over and over and over and over because man-made wisdom doesn't suffice when there's a crisis that hits. People look to God. I can't imagine a time more ripe where people are looking, they're searching they're curious. Will they find a church that gathers to get together because of the gospel? Because of what God has done for us? Where knowing him is the essential first step. You can't have anything else until you have that. Or will they find a church that's arguing and bickering and conflict over masks and who knows what else? And I don't, literally, I don't care. Because the only thing I care about as, a, as the pastor of this church is seeing people who are desperately crying out for help get help. That's why God has placed us on this earth. And friends, this is exactly why Paul starts with the gospel after he brings up this issue of division. Because the only thing that can really bring us together is God and what he's done in our life. If you've never given your heart to Christ, I wanna invite you. <laughs> This moment, every single week, we point to Jesus, and we want to give you an opportunity to embrace him as your Lord and Savior. Jesus wants to save you, and it starts with belief. If you can't believe, I want you to just pray, God, help my unbelief. Help me to believe. Pray with me right now. Father, we want to believe. We do believe that Jesus' death on the cross was enough to save me from my sins, to forgive me to lead me in paths of righteousness, and this doesn't make sense to me all the time, but God, in your wisdom, this was your path, and we choose your path. Now keep us humble and help me to share this with all who I come in contact with in the name of Jesus, amen. I wanna encourage you with the next step. We've got a video for you. They will point you in the direction of a closer relationship with Jesus.